Back in 2006, I was on the Committee for Best Books for Young Adults from YALSA. And during that time, that's when American-born Chinese came in the mail to me. And being of Chinese descent, I said, oh, good. I get it. I'm excited to read this book. And when I started reading, I was totally turned off. I was like, wow, this is crazy. So um, <laughs> I put the book down. And then I read the SLJ interview that they did with Gene. And I got a new perspective on American-born Chinese and why Gene wrote it. So then I picked it up. And I um, fell in love with American-born Chinese um, the second time. I <clears throat> felt it really was empowering. I nominated it for the committee and was excited. Uh, I believe it was in Seattle and, um, when they started announcing all the different award winners and when they got to the prints, because I thought for sure some other books were going to win. And they got honors. And so I said, oh, we're trying to figure out who's going to win. And they um, said, American-born Chinese. It, the room really erupted because that was the first um, time a graphic novel w was a uh, Prince winner, so that was super exciting. Uh, then later in June, um, I had the privilege of uh, first second inviting me to dinner with Jean. I couldn't find the darn restaurant, so I was like the last one there. So all my friends on the committee were in a different part, and I had to sit, I didn't, well, they, they asked me, I didn't have to, but um, <laughs> they asked me to sit by Jean's wife, Teresa. So I sat by Teresa and we started talking, and lo and behold, um, my cousin's wife uh, met Jean at UC Berkeley, so we had this connection, so we started talking about that, that was really cool. And a couple of years later, Megan Mathis joined our staff, and she wanted to use American-born Chinese in her class, and I got super excited, and I said, oh, maybe we can get Jean to do a Skype. So for eight years, we've had Gene do a Skype. And in 2015, Gene came to our school. And he did an all-school assembly. He's fabulous. Well worth the money, you guys. So I highly encourage you to do that. And then, Checks in the mail, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> you pay me later. Um, so it's really exciting to be a part of this. And um, Megan's going to share a little bit about her process, about how she uses the graphic novel American Born Chinese. So to give you a little bit of context about myself, I've been teaching English for 19 years, uh, the past eight of them at Jesuit High School. Um, and while our school has made really excellent strides in incorporating a more diverse student population, we are still a predominantly white school. Um, and our English curriculum focuses largely on works by and about white people. So what I want to talk about today are, are just some of the challenges that I and my colleagues have faced in integrating diverse books into our curriculum. I've been an advocate of teaching diverse books for most of my career, um, but really it's only been in the past few years that I've come to clearly understand that my students' ability to interact with and grow from these texts depend largely on their degree of experience and comfort with talking about privilege and race. And I've met a lot of educators who've shared my experience of putting a great book in the hands of my students, the woman warrior, beloved, a place to stand, kindred, and then wondering why this book wasn't working its magic on my students the way it had worked its magic on me, um, and why it wasn't working the way other books by white authors were working for them. And I've realized that the connection that I failed to make in those years was that my understanding of race and privilege, my racial literacy, had been slowly evolving over the course of my education and my adult life and opening up these books to me in ways that just couldn't happen for my students given their comparative illiteracy in those areas. So why use graphic novels? In his book, Promoting Racial Literacy in Schools, Howard Stevenson describes a set of knowledge, language, and skills that can help all students navigate and respond to racially charged situations and racial stress. Stevenson's work helped me realize that my more recent successes at teaching diverse books was owing to the fact that I had started teaching racial literacy skills right alongside those books. And I realized that too often in schools, we put books in students' hands that confront them with racism and its effects without necessarily giving them the specific literacy skills that they need to process and respond to those books. Jean's American Born Chinese was a game changer for me. It totally changed my teaching practice when I started teaching it eight years ago. 
Um, the book really did not work the first two years that I taught it, um, and I almost gave up on it. My students were resentful, and they were surly. By and large, they insisted that Jin's experience was unrealistic, or if it was believable, his experiences could not in any way have been shaped by racism. And they further claimed that there was simply no way that they could identify with any of the characters in the book. And when I look back on those first two years now, two things are apparent to me. I wish they had been apparent to me then. Um, for many of my students, American Born Chinese was the first book that they had read and discussed that was not about white people. And two, I had done very little to prepare them to discuss the issues of race, culture, and identity. I think somewhere along the line, I was convinced that that was happening somewhere else. Um, and as a result, the experience of reading and discussing that book was creating a tremendous amount of racial stress for all of my students. It was stressing out my white students because they'd never been asked to talk about race before. They'd never been asked to read a book about a character that was different from them. And for my students of color, it was creating stress because they weren't sure to what extent they could talk about their own experiences in the book. So over time, I developed a series of lessons that gave my students a way into conversations about race without creating too much racial, racial stress. Um, Stevenson's work helped give me a name to what I was doing. I was using the abstractions inherent in the graphic novel genre and the absolute brilliance of Jean's work in particular to teach my students about racial literacy. So the images I have on these next two slides come from Scott McCloud's book, Understanding Comics, and this has been another total game changer for me. In one section of the book, he talks about a concept called abstraction, and he explains that the more photorealistic an image is, the narrower the range of people who can identify with that image. Um, and so what comics do is create images that are abstract enough that a greater number of people can identify with them or can at least project themselves onto that character, almost like an avatar, um, and into their experiences. And then thinking about abstraction got me to another idea, totally just a theory. I have nothing to back this up. But I think that my students were responding to texts about race and identity in the same way that they might respond to a photorealistic image or fail to respond to a photorealistic image of another person. So Scott McCloud's book made me think that if abstract images in comics could give more students a way into the character's experience, that if I went further than just talking about the images, if I started talking about the grammar of comics, composition, layout, color, um, that I might be able to find, again, a less, less racially stressful way into the text. So I've definitely come to believe that the specific grammar of comics makes comics one of the best vehicles we could possibly hope for, for telling stories about the experiences of minorities and the marginalized. Um, the reason I've stuck with American-born Chinese all these years, I, I get this question a lot, like, okay, well, you've taught American-born Chinese for a while now, and it's been out for a while now. Why don't you teach something new? Um, because every year I find something else that I didn't see before, or usually it's my students who find something else um, that I didn't see before. So most recently, just last year, we got onto the topic of representation of minorities in Hollywood and cultural appropriation, which was not really something that we had talked about with the book before, but it totally lends itself to that conversation well. So as long as the book continues to be a gold mine for me and my students, I will keep teaching it. At this point, I want to say that I don't want to give anybody the idea that there's absolutely no discomfort at all in using graphic novels to talk about race. Some version of this conversation has happened every year that I've taught this book. Um, and I actually just confided to my students over lunch that I am scared every year when I start this unit because I know that there is explosive potential in the conversations. And this is the conversation that I'm waiting for, and this is kind of the conversation I'm dreading. The moment when a student says, well, Jin would be a lot happier if he just stopped trying to be something he's not. And then I'm like, oh, here it comes. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, what do you mean by, by something he's not? Well, you know, he should just stop trying to be American. I said, well, he was 
born in California. He is an American. And then there's that silence. Um, the silence of a student, usually a white student, just being brought up suddenly with the realization of their own bias, that to them, American means white. So this is what a typical lesson looks like when I teach American-born Chinese. This is actually the first lesson that we do on the book. So for some context, at this point, the students have already read the book in its entirety. And then we go back and we talk about it in pieces. Um, the students have also already had a crash course in the language of graphic novels and the, uh, the structural conventions of graphic novels. And they've also had a week-long crash course in language related to race and culture and identity. So they have a new vocabulary that they're using. Um, with this particular image, what I found is that analyzing composition and layout on this page encourages students to start by thinking about the causes of Jin's and Wei Chen's feelings. And in doing so, they become a lot more receptive to understanding and articulating what those experiences and what those feelings are. And these are some student responses that I took um, just from a thesis development assignment that we do with this particular panel. And you can, I think you can really see here that already, really early in the book, they're starting to engage with the language. By analyzing the composition and the layout, they have that abstraction, they have that level of distance that lets them start to develop their facility with some of these terms. Um, so they're already talking about cultural tension, they're already talking about assimilation, and they're already starting to think a little bit about privilege. Um, and the level of comfort in the room is much higher because they're working in pairs to talk about the book on an abstract level and then getting into the specifics. This is a lesson that we do a little bit later in the text. Um, and this is just another great page where the students are analyzing eye contact, the layout of the panels, details like the garbage can next to Jin, um, in order to talk about the unspoken racial tension in the scene and how it makes both of the boys feel. Um, when I first started teaching American-born Chinese, this was one of the pages that students reacted against the most strongly. Um, they flatly rejected the idea that race has anything to do with Greg's request in this moment that Jin stop dating his white friend, Amelia. Um, but analyzing the composition and the layout just reveals so many nuances about the way the scene is constructed that students not only come to the conclusion that, yeah, race is likely a factor in Greg's request, um, but they can also see how the microaggressive nature of Greg's question and his interaction with Jin is more hurtful to Jin than most of the overt racism that he experiences in the book. So I think Gregory has put together a page um, where I have my teaching materials on American-born Chinese. If you or if any of your teachers at your school would like to take a look at them, they are freely up for grabs. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to my students now. Thank you. So there's the link for um, all the material that's available um, related to American-born Chinese. So now I have some questions for my students, and then Gene will give his input as well. <laughs> so the first question is, in your opinion, what makes American-born Chinese in particular a good vehicle for having conversations about race? Paul? So I would think that, for me, what made American-born Chinese so particularly insightful was the fact that there's something very, I think, profound about how this book can be inherently comedic. You can look at it and you can, you can just go through and read it and you can have a good time with the three narratives that are being pre presented in the book. But once you start to really dive into what is happening, dive into what Gene like masterfully puts into these three narratives, it becomes a lot more profound and insightful in the conversations you start to have it starts to become a catalyst for racial dialogue and having these uncomfortable conversations like Ms. Mathis was talking about. Um, I'm really reminded of that one specific moment Ms. Mathis talked about where um, we had that exact conversation word for word and I took a moment and I took a breath in and that was a moment where this book, which Ms. Mathis has a theory about how this book can either be a mirror or a window for people. For me, it was a window. It was a window into the experience of people seeing the world from a very different perspective than I see it from. And that was a specific moment where 
I, my experience with this book shifted from a window to a mirror because I was able to see in my own life where I had been employing racial slurs, where I had started to employ microaggressions subconsciously, not intentionally being racist. And I think what really makes this book a particularly good vehicle for having conversations about race is that it is universal and it appeals to such an array of audience members and it's an incredible mode for seeing the tangible um, illustrations of how race is very prevalent in our society and the repercussions of what happens if we don't have these dialogues. Hi everyone, my name is Sahana. Um, what made this book a good vehicle, in my opinion, um, for talking about race and racism um, is the fact that it is a gra graphic novel. Um, a lot of my classmates, now, I had the unique experience of having read this book before we brought it up again sophomore year. Um, but a lot of my classmates, upon seeing that it was a graphic novel, um, you know, knowing that they were going to be reading a graphic novel sophomore year, um, had the initial, you know, had that split second initial thought of why are we reading a graphic novel? Graphic novels are for kids, comics are for kids. Um, but the fact is, this graphic novel, without, without the illustrations, and uh, my classmates and I talked about this uh, last night when we were going over the book. Um, without the illustrations, talking about race surrounding this book would have been so much more difficult. Something about the fact that it is a graphic novel, that there are illustrations to go along with the words, that you can see expressions on characters' faces after particular moments in the book. Something about that made it so much easier to, to start that conversation, if not carry it out in full, because there will always be a kind of tension and uncomfortableness surrounding race, especially when you're you know, talking about it in a diverse classroom or you know, in a classroom that isn't so diverse. There will always be tension surrounding race and there will always, every student will have a different reaction, but the fact that there, are, there is an image to go along with the words, that there is an expression you can see that goes along with a moment where you feel a character is uh, being microaggressive towards another character, you can see the reactions in the character's faces and something about that makes it so much more powerful. Thank you so much for that. You. Um, hi, I'm James. And one of the reasons I think that this book is so perfect for talking about grace is because it allows whoever is reading it, if they really go into it, and allow themselves to experience the wide range of emotions, not only experienced by the Asian American characters, but by the white characters who feel similar sensations of extreme appalling embarrassment and shame, they can learn to bridge the gap between races into I'm a human being and I experience this wide prevailing sense of shame and so do you. So obviously as a white person, I don't have to think about race in America as much as many of my colleagues and peers who are not white who do have to think about it and who do constantly worry about it growing up. But this book was interesting for me because I had a similar sort of experience of looking at it not only as a, not only as a window into someone else's experience, but a mirror into my own experiences. So growing up as someone who is not straight and growing up as someone who has a brother who is gay, I'm constantly confronted with images of who to become as a human being, whether to become extremely flamboyant and identify with this entire culture to become accepted, or whether to overcompensate, to um, change my physical experience to become more masculine. And either way I end up going, I feel fake to myself. So when I was reading this book, my brother, who is gay, had read it before me, and what struck me was he said, you know, when I was going through this book and reading it, I realized that growing up, because you would act flamboyantly, or not even flamboyantly, but just effeminately, you were chin ki to me, cousin chin ki. So this is the portrayal of cousin chin ki, this portrayal to anyone who's growing up Asian American is briefly horrifying. And I was 
able to understand so much better this level of horror because when he said that to me, he said, when you act effeminately, when you act flamboyantly, when you identify with that non-dominant culture, you become a monster to me. You become an expression of all of the fears and everything that I do not want to become, everything that I've never wanted to become over the course of my entire life. And I still deal with that, with identifying more with one sense of expression than with another sense of expression. But I think the beautiful thing about this and talking about this is that race and sexuality are two totally different issues. But by going into this and experiencing it this way with this specific lens, I was able to equate the supreme horror and confusion and utter astonishment with who society tells me I can become, just like someone who is growing up Asian American, just like someone who is dealing between the dominant culture, the non-dominant culture, and becoming someone who's real and true to yourself outside of those cultures, and choosing the toxicities of those cultures, and just leaving them all behind. So I'm Amanda, and I think what makes this book really good for talking about race is that it's not about pitying, it's not about like pitying people of color. So before we read this book in school, the only context in which I had talked about race in school was like segregation and slavery and terrible, overtly racist things, and things that have been done to people of color, so things that we've had no control over. But in this book, it's specifically about those people of color, and it's about like it humanizes us, and it says that we are also humans, we also make mistakes, and we have relationships and friendships, and we have our own concept of identity with relation to our race. And it's not just, oh, pity the people of color because all these terrible things have happened to them. It's also, we are humans who also can be humorous and can have relationships and have a complex identity based I have to say, being, being here um, with these teachers and with these students is more than a cartoonist's dream come true. Uh, when I did American Born Chinese, I started it as a, as a self-published uh, comic. So I would actually, I would finish a, a chapter, I'd take it to my local Kinko's, I'd Xerox copy the, the chapter, I'd staple it by hand, I'd take it to my local comic book convention and I'd try to sell it by hand. I'd sell like, I don't know, like 15 copies. It'd be like my mom and 14 of my friends. <laughs> you know, so to go from there to here is just, uh, to, to sitting on a panel with people who are um, roughly 20 times as smart as I was when I was their age. And you all, you all are only about three times as smart as me now, but you're, you're 20 times smarter than 18 year old Gene. It's, 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 it's really uh, beyond an honor. Um, one, one of the fears that I have with American More Chinese, you know, when, when I was working on that scale where I was only doing 15 copies, I knew everybody that was reading my book, you know? So, so people sometimes ask, you know, um, is there, is there any, any regret that you have? And, and I wonder, when I was doing those 15 copies, if I had known it'd eventually become a full color graphic novel, if I'd known eventually kids would have to do homework assignments about it, <laughs> would, I have, would, would, would I have been courageous enough or would I have been brave enough to, to create a character like Cousin Chinky? In the book, Cousin Chinky is the embodiment of um, all of the, the negative Asian and Asian American, Chinese, Chinese American stereotypes that I could think of. It was almost, it was like an exorcism for me to, to put that on the page. And, and I have to say, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, because there's this danger, right? When you talk explicitly about stereotypes, you always run the danger of um, perpetuating that stereotype by, by talking about it explicitly. So in, in a way, by, by putting out the full color graphic novel uh, version of American Born Chinese, for a second, my publisher and I, we were kind of trusting that this book would be read in thoughtful communities. And that's exactly what this is. This is like sort of a, a balm for all my fears, to see that um, this community is, is reading those passages in such an amazingly thoughtful way. So thank you all.
for, for doing what you're doing. The next question is, what specific moments in the text cause tension or discomfort for you? So there's one moment when um, the third or the second narrative starts where it's Jin who is arriving to his new classroom. Um, and there's one moment where his teacher, her name is Mrs. Greeter, um, says, class, I'd like us all to give a warm Mayflower Elementary welcome to your new friend and classmate, Jing Jang. And he corrects her by saying Jin Wang, and she corrects herself. And then she proceeds to say, he and his family recently moved to our neighborhood all the way from China. And he corrects her by saying San Francisco. <laughs> so that is one of the initial panels that you see in this narrative. And it's a very jarring panel for me because when you read it, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But then you go on to see how much this affects Jin's relationships with his friends, how he's begins to be, he begins to become marginalized by the people he goes to school with. And all of these racial slurs, these microaggressions that have become so prevalent in society and are almost swept under the rug, this book brings them to light. And it very tangibly makes it so that students like us can see this, and especially me who I, I am white. I, I haven't dealt with a lot of these issues that are happening every day. And being able to see this on a page where I'm able to see through a window of this graphic novel, of seeing these experiences happen and how jarring it can be and how heartbreaking and demolishing it can be to these people who have to deal and with something that they did not choose to be. They were born this way. And that, yeah, it, it's, it's jarring. It really is. And I think that was a moment where it caused a lot of discomfort for me because, as I said in my first response, I really wanted to strive to be better, to be a better human being who is more accepting and who seeks to foster belonging to people who feel outcast and marginalized by these little moments that are everywhere. And opening up the dialogue with panels like this and analyzing the expressions like Sahana was tapping into, the expressions on their faces, and being able to see how this graphic novel really fostered those dialogues. Um, it was specific moments like this scattered all through the novel that really caused that discomfort, but opened up the possibility to have conversations about it, which was really integral. The majority of this book and the conversations surrounding this book, for me, were not, I could feel external tension within the classroom. People, you know, trying to figure out how to have a conversation about race, maybe while getting angry, but still being able to accept other people's points. But for me, internally, this was liberating. This book was liberating. This conversation was liberating. This was me finally voicing all the things I'd felt for, my, for the majority of my self-aware life. Um, <laughs> um, it was finally coming out in a classroom setting. It was finally telling people who had no idea, you know, telling... Telling people, you know, like Paul, honestly, people who I'd spent my days with and enjoyed the company of, but who'd never, who I'd never had a conversation about my identity with, finally telling them this, the cultural struggles I face on a day-to-day -day basis, and it felt so good. <laughs> um, that said, there were moments in this book, this book acted as a mirror for me. Um, Paul mentioned the mirror versus window theory. This, this book was completely and totally a mirror for me. Um, but there were, and most of it was a mirror that I enjoyed looking into because, not because it reflected something good back at me, back at me, but, but because it was the only book that ever reflected me, that ever reflected what I felt. But there were moments in the book where the mirror wasn't quite so welcome. One such moment was on page 97 of the book. There are no words on this page of the book. The entire thing is just picture panels. But what strikes me here is this. Jin is thinking about Amelia, a girl he really wants to be with. Then he's thinking about Amelia and her friend Greg. Then he's thinking about Greg. Then he's thinking about what he thinks makes Greg Greg, and he knows that Amelia likes Greg. So perhaps if he's a little more like Greg, Amelia will like him too. My sophomore year, I marked this an arbitrary marker of difference. And it reflected back to me things I've been doing my entire life that I didn't want to see. For example, wearing makeup. I started wearing makeup, a full face every day, in middle school. It, honestly, I started wearing makeup. I like to think I started wearing makeup because I like art and I like to um, use my face as a canvas. But 
I started wearing makeup because I chose it as my arbitrary marker of difference. I went to a prim primarily white middle school. My class was small. There was only one other student of color um, in the class. And everyone else, except for that other student of color and I, wore makeup. All the other girls. I chose makeup as my arbitrary marker of difference, but this book made me acknowledge that I chose makeup as my arbitrary marker of difference. It made me acknowledge that I had to choose an arbitrary marker of difference at all, which uh, caused a lot of internal tension for me. One moment in particular in this text that caused a huge amount of like revelation, at the same time horror for me, was um, later in the book when, as I began looking into it more as not only um, not only a mirror, but also as a window, and not only as a window, but also as a mirror. When um, Jin is talking to his best friend, who is completely Chinese, although he moves to America and grows up in America, he's talking to his friend's girlfriend, who is American-born Japanese. And she shares with him the struggles and the tensions of daily life, wondering, how do people perceive me as, even though I'm just like them? I grew up here, but I'm not just like them. And what he ends up doing, even though it's his best friend's girlfriend, is he kisses her. And this panel said so much to me because it opens up this world of you experience the same pain with yourself and having to choose between two identities, one that you loathe with all of your being, and the other which you strive to achieve but can never feasibly do so. You get that, you experience that, and you feel that, and I want to extend my body onto yours because I feel that too, and I want to make sure you know that you are not alone in that, that someone else feels that too. Almost immediately after, Wei Chen, his friend, confronts him about it, and Jin's words just break my heart every single time. He says, Jin says to his Chinese friend Wei Chen, you and I are not alike. We are nothing alike. And don't worry about your stupid girlfriend. She's not my type. Then why? Implying, why did you kiss her? Maybe, Jin responds, I just don't think you're right for her, all right? Maybe I don't think you're worthy of her. Maybe I think she can do better than an FOB, a fresh off the boat like you. And that reflects this complete and utter sense of revulsion towards the non-dominant culture that throughout his entire life, Jin has wanted to escape from. And how that inspires him to close himself off, not only, not only through arbitrary markers, but also socially and emotionally from people who exemplify that culture. And it breaks my heart every time. And part of the reason I think this is so important to teach in schools and to talk about in schools is that it's so relevant to us as students because we are going to have to deal with problems of dominant culture and non-dominant culture, even if we all were straight, cisgendered white males, we would still have to deal with that and confront that because it's a part of our lives. But this book doesn't skirt that under the rug. It, and if properly taught, we can learn to grow through one another rather than pushing other people down, extending our roots into them as if they are our soil and trying to extend our branches to a heaven we'll never be able to reach and that really won't give us happiness anyways. So something that caused tension for me about this book was something really unexpected, and it wasn't necessarily a specific moment. It was just the presence of talking about Chinese culture in the context of a mostly white class. So I'm half Chinese, and I kind of claim it as my own kind of like Chinese culture and I identify as it, and it was so weird to me for the first time to see that culture in an English book, like in English class. And 
in a way that caused tension for me because I felt weirdly defensive of it, and that's not a fault of the book at all. That's just a result of not having that representation like normally in class. And so it was strange because I felt really defensive of this, of like Chinese culture in a book, and I was afraid of having white people in our class talk about a culture that I think of as mine and something that's such a personal experience. But that ended up as a really good thing because certain people in our class, like people of color, or people who are Chinese specifically, had personal connections to this book and to the experience that Gene has as he grows up. So having those conversations in class was, I think it was really cathartic for us and also opened up the eyes of a lot of other people to experiences that aren't like their own. I, I don't know if I have anything useful to add. But again, thank you all, thank you all. Um, the, the moment that you, that you spoke about, James, actually is, is um, loosely based on uh, something that happened in, when I was a kid. When I was, a, when I was in junior high, there were two groups of Asian American boys. Uh, me and my friends were mostly born in America. Uh, we spoke to each other in English, we didn't have accents. And then there was this other group of kids that came to the United States when they were older. They came when they were uh, like in fourth or fifth, sixth grade. They spoke with accents. We, we used to call them FOBs, fresh off the boats. And, um, and we were mean to them for no good reason. It, it, at, at the time, it was just a very thoughtless and, and visceral thing. Um, as an adult, when I look back, I realize it was because that was how we were dealing with our own difference. We felt different from the majority culture around us. We took out that difference on these kids that, um, that we, we thought of as even more different than we were. So, so thank you. Thank you for, for talking about that in such, a, such an articulate way. Yes, thank you. Uh, the next question is, what do you wish we had talked about more or differently during the reading of American Born Chinese? There are a lot of really, really interesting symbols that get played upon in this book. Um, it was James's example, actually, that talked about that moment where um, the kiss happens. You might have noticed that his hair is look like, it looks like it's exploding, almost. And this is a really prevalent symbol in the book. Um, and Sahan tapped into it, too, as well, when she talked about how that all started. The idea of hair being a very physical marker of assimilation, of if I get to have this trait, then I get to be this person, and I get to finally have something that I've never been able to have because I don't have this one feature. So I think analyzing these symbols very literally and diving into why they are employed, why they are very intentionally put in specific situations where those symbols even, even little symbols like um, the trash can. We talked about the trash can at lunch where um, it was in one of those slides that Ms. Mathis had where um, Greg is talking to Jen and says, like, we're, we're, I'm worried about who um, Amelia hangs out with and Jen is right next to a trash can. And little symbols like this, it's, I, I really hope that when we, if I were to have this conversation again, I would have loved to see the common th thread between all these symbols and how they all tied together to uh, portray even further these racial discussions that we were having. For me, honestly, uh, the thing that I wish had happened in that class, I wish we'd had more time. I wish we'd had more time to talk about race. I wish we'd had more time to talk about identity and how race relates to identity and how code switching works and how Jin is being, you know, Jin is being practically drawn and quartered in two different directions with his Chinese identity in one and his American identity in, in another. And I wish we could have talked about how he seems to completely loathe his Chinese identity in a way, in a way I could relate to, but at the same time, I'm so proud sometimes of my own heritage. Uh, my parents were both born and brought up in India. Um, I wish we could have talked about some of, uh, in, more in depth about the things we, we, we chipped just the top of the iceberg off of the whole conversation on race, and I wish we'd had more time. Personally, I wish that we would have talked more just at the very, as a capstone to the entire unit that is American-born Chinese, and not only race, but dealing with one's collective identity and all of one's collective identities how to do it, how to actually deal with it. Because as human beings, we're all going to have to deal with not only stereotypes, but just how people perceive us 
And we're going to think about that and deal with that on a daily basis. And I love this book because it brings up in such a potent and oftentimes shocking but liberating way all of these things that tear people apart on the inside. But once that's brought up, I feel like it ne people need to be able to, looking at it, say, OK, race, identity, who I am, which culture I choose to embrace, and how much of it, it's a bucket of eels. And going forward, I'm going to need to have to open it up, and I'm going to have to reach my hands into it. This book has the power to open it up, but I love help learning how to just be completely real and me and not have to worry about, oh, I'm identifying too much as someone who's flamboyant. I'm identifying as this stereotype, as this image. <laughs> this is who I want to become. This is who I have to be, because those aren't real identity. So I think the skill to be able to start reaching into the bucket and physically pulling out each electi electric eel that's hurting you, that's a great skill but being able to clean it and to heal oneself and one's own wounds through empathy and through taking control of one's own identity in the future is a big focus that can't obviously be covered, but at least can be started at the capstone. So I think one of the things that we should always talk about when we read any book that's about being a minority in that experience is we have to be careful not to make this one narrative, this one narrative about one Chinese kid, and it's very common narrative, I think, but it's not everyone's story. So I'm multiracial, and I kind of identified with this because I'm part Chinese, but it's not my story, and I haven't had the same experiences that Jean has. And so I think that what we did really well in our class was having discussions. And so we had the opportunity to talk about different experiences and different stories of race that aren't necessarily the same as this, but were discussions that were started by this book. And this book just gave us the opportunity to talk about race in all of its different forms, and not just the specific narrative. It's hard. It's hard to follow them. I have to tell you. Okay. <laughs> it's really hard to follow them. <laughs> so as students, what advice would you give to these librarians out here who are considering promoting this book in their library or giving it to students? What words of wisdom would you offer to this group? You will get a very wide range of reactions from this book. You can tell. <laughs> um, I think the beauty of this book is that if you can resonate with this book, that's incredible. If you don't resonate with this book, that's also incredible. Because there's something really profound about every justifiable reaction you have to this book. Because these aren't easy conversations. They're not. Like Ms. Mathis said, it took two to three years to really figure out a way to get this going and figure out a way to open up dialogues that are both accepting of everyone's opinions and reactions to this book, but also analyzing why they're having those reactions. I think, if, uh, I think some advice would just be really open and accepting to that wide range of reactions that you will get, because they will be intense. They will be sometimes very frustrating and I remember uh, vividly like all of my reactions that were very frustrating. I, I was frustrated that sometimes I couldn't resonate with this book when I, when I wanted to feel it, when I wanted to feel what these characters were feeling. And if anything, that is just bringing that into dialogue and really emphasizing the role of conversation in analyzing this book is so, so incredibly formative. I couldn't stress that more. Um, really opening up that forum to just voice your opinion and your experiences and being very, sometimes brutally honest about what you have lived through and what you're going to live through knowing that this book has shaped you and shaped the paradigms that you see the world with. Your guys' job is one of extreme power. You guys are the people who put books into the hands Absolutely. of people who are forming their identities. I mean, I think about that. I'm sure you guys have thought about that so much, but I think <laughs> about that and I'm like, I'm, I am so awed by what you do. 
like I said, um, this book, I had the unique experience of reading this book before my sophomore year. In fact, it was put into my hands by a librarian when I was nine years old. I have to say that that probably really changed my experience of the book the second time around. I walked into reading this book sophomore year excited, but also thinking I knew exactly what to expect, and I was dead wrong. I was dead wrong. <laughs> but I think that my main, I guess my words of wisdom for this book are give it, give it to people. You have to give it to people because this, this right here, the display of diversity you see up here only happened because of this book, because of that class, because we had that conversation. You have to give people this book, but you also have to give them the resources to process this book. And you have to give it to them at an age and a, and a time when they're able and they have the mental capacity to read this book and understand and be able, to, be able to think about those questions it brings up. Because when I was nine years old and I read this book, it brought up questions about my identity that I was not ready to deal with at the time. And it made my middle school years that much harder. It made me that much less sure of who I was. It made me that much more polarized, pulled in two opposite directions. And I didn't know how to react, especially to the chin key part of the book. Um, that was really tough for me to deal with um, sophomore year when I realized how I'd seen it when I was nine years old. Um, so my words of wisdom are put this book into people's hands, help them understand what's happening in this book, but put it in their hands when they're able to read it and able to deal with the consequences and the, um, the conversations that start up because of it. I also think that as educators and as people who are mentors for so many young people, in addition to giving it to people when they're ready to start helping them nudging at this issue and start unraveling it, being there for them throughout the painful process and helping them learn how to form themselves. Because I, I read this book when I was 16. I read Fun Home shortly after it. Um, and now I'm almost 18, and identity is still very daunting for me. And I'm sure for all of you as well, because it's part of the human experience. But helping other human beings through that is a huge thing. One other thing I feel like is really important to mention is as educators and just as people, try thinking more not only about microaggressions, but reframing them in a new way. Because I don't like the word microaggression. Because I feel like it does a couple things horribly wrong. One, micro implies that it's something small. It's never something small. And aggression implies that it's one person oftentimes intentionally wanting to hurt another. I don't think that's always accurate. Um, like last week, I was walking home from school from the bus stop and I remember it very clearly. I was wearing like this reddish pink button up shirt and a kid from another school who I didn't know at all ended up calling out at me, hey, faggot. And I just kept walking. And characterize that as a microaggression, characterize that as an aggression. But in that moment, I did not feel like he was angry at me. And in that moment, I don't feel like he was what was making me so horrified. He was not what was making me feel so horrified. A better word than microaggression, I feel like, is macro oppression. Because it focuses on something that pervades the entirety of society and not only, not only focuses on how I'm feeling as someone receiving that, as thinking, should I have not this, is this shirt color too flamboyant? Am I walking in too stiff and polite a way? Do I need to change myself in order to fit the dominant culture more? Not only my experiences, but the experience of the aggressor. Why do you have to feel that need to say that word? What is oppressing you to make you lash out like that? And it reframes it so that it's not just aggressors and the people who are hurt. It views, as, it views us both as entities and human beings who are bleeding. And that's why 
thinking of it as a macro oppression starts getting at it more. And it removes this dichotomy that says, there is an enemy who has power over me, and there's a victim. It starts saying, we are both oppressed by the same thing that horrifies the both of us. And that's a huge new way to start seeing him not only as like someone who's shouting, hey, faggot at me, but as someone who's hurting just as much as me and making me say, you know what? Yes, there is something to love your enemies because your enemy is just as much yourself. And encouraging that thought process takes apart PC culture and the backlash towards being overly politically correct into this is not us and them. This is us trying to deal with it. So I have a couple pieces of advice for educators. And the first one's pretty obvious. It's just have conversations. I think the most important thing this book can do is start those conversations about race, about being a minority, and about identity. And before I read this book, I'd had those conversations, but never with white people before. So it was just quite an experience. Last night, we just sat at that fountain outside for like two hours and just talked about race. And it was amazing. It was so cathartic for us. And it was eye-opening, I think. And I think that's one of the most important things this book can do. And the other thing is going off of that. And what I said before is that when you have conversations, you realize that this experience isn't universal, so not every person of color will resonate with this book. Not, ev not even every Chinese American person will, because this is just one story of a minority person, and everyone's story is different. And I think when you have conversations and you hear those other stories, and those other sides of being a like, Chinese American or being a minority, and I think that when you have conversations, you hear all those different sides, and just having this one story can bring out so many other ones. Again, I can't, I, I can't thank you all enough, honestly. <laughs> like uh, like the, the way you all, uh, you all share in such a, such a courageous way. Thank you, thank you all so much. I, I think, um, I feel, uh, We're gonna open up to the floor now. So if you have any questions for any of the students or for Jean, if you would go to one of the microphones. I'll just jump right up here. Um, I am curious, this is kind of the, to the teachers, how your uh, conversations have gone since you've been doing this now for so many years, um, how your conversations have changed from year to year, considering that you know, a couple of years ago we didn't use words like microaggressions, um, how the current political climate has changed your discussions and if you've seen a trend or seen major differences now that you've done this for several years. Uh, yeah, and you know, when I mentioned that I'll, I'll stop teaching Jean's book when it stops yielding more for me to do, um, I was sort of speaking to that. Um, every year I've added something different to the unit and I've emphasized some things and de-emphasized others. Um, actually, the year, so these are high school seniors um, they read the book that they were the year that they were sophomores, and that was the first year that I did um, a focus lesson on microaggressions for a couple of reasons. Like one, because it was I knew that it was a term that they were starting to see a lot through social media, through the news, but also because like that was what we had started talking about. We had started talk. We had moved the conversation away from some of the more overt displays of racism in the book, like from the character Timmy, if you're familiar with the narrative. Um, and we had really started to focus a lot more on Greg. And that wasn't coming from me, that was coming from them. Um, so I do think that, that everything that's happening in the, in the current political and social climate feeds into what they notice in the book and what they are interested in the book. So last year, um, I always do a lesson where we look at some of the allusions in Jean's text. Um, there's a fantastic allusion to John Hughes's film, 16 Candles. Um, there's a really good allusion to William Hung's performance on American Idol. 
Um, and the students have always been interested in those, but last year the topic of representation came up because some of the students have been reading articles about the lack of representation of minorities. I think this was right around the time that there was a fair amount of hubbub about Tilda Swinton being cast in um, Doctor Strange. And so I realized, like, okay, I can, I can do something with that. Um, I will also admit that for three years now I've had a lesson ready to go on white privilege. And every year I have chickened out on doing it, but um, they told me this this is year I have to do it. So, um, and I and I think that I think that there is enough discussion of that topic going on right now that I'm going to jump this year. Oh, and, and as for the current political climate, I don't know yet how the book is going to go this year. I suspect that that will change how the book goes. Um, and I start teaching it in about three weeks. So I'll let you know. <laughs> Hello, uh, wonderful panel. Y'all were amazing. I agree with uh, the author. Uh, Y'all are hard to follow. Um, but a lot of the conversations about um, kind of processing the book seem to be directed at the students and like how the you know, you know how educators, librarians can help them process it. But what I know, having been a teacher, um, you know, as adults and as people, we walk around each and every day with all types of implicit biases and all types of unresolved issues as adults. And so I would be curious about any advice you have for how li librarians and the adults in the room could process the book. Not even, I mean, like, Putting the, the students to the side, like, what advice do you have for them in thinking about how they might want to, you know, process this amazing book? Part of what helps processing identity in many ways is learning how to fall in love with every single person you meet. And that's horrifyingly difficult. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> Because you meet so many people in your life who are so overwhelmingly different from you in so many different ways, you go, how can you feel the same things as I do? How can this be true? But be open in many ways to the idea of not only other people, but yourself as well, of human beings being a dynamic process and identity being a dynamic process. Like growing up, I was raised extremely Catholic. I am extremely Catholic. I'm an ardent believer. I love C.S. Lewis. And I love allusions to the Bible. And that's a real part of my identity. But that doesn't mean I'm any less someone who is not heterosexual. That doesn't mean that that's an inherent contradiction, that you can't be Catholic and someone who is bisexual or pansexual or what have you. And it also doesn't mean that I can't be a boy and someone who's on and off masculine too. Because like, no matter who you are, you're gonna be pulled in different directions on who to be. Um, I've been pulled to be, by religion, less sexual and more theological, um, to the point of it being repressive at some points, by, um, expectations on what males should be to be more sexual to the point of it being negative and to be more masculine and fit the dominant culture even if it makes me feel fake or to be more flamboyant and funny and fun to be around just because it it can feel easier but if you if you start viewing people as dynamic processes whose instru whose interests can change at the drop of a hat who can go from loving Japanese death metal one second to Bach, <laughs> as people, as diverse, growing, constantly shaping human beings who are bleeding and trying their best not to, you can start growing beyond just issues of race because you feel like the people who you're falling in love with more and more, the people who you're meeting, they're people too and they're bleeding just as much as you are. I kind of wanted to add to that really quickly. Um, I like what you said about um, the fact that you guys are adults 
walking around every day with biases, and you're wondering how to process the book based on the fact that you're walking around every day with biases. I, I agree with James. One of the ways is to you know, try and love everyone you meet, no matter how difficult that may be. But the other part, I'm going to base this off one of my own experiences, and that experience is meeting James. I met James my freshman year, pretty early into it. Um, I had no idea what to make of him, absolutely none. I did not know how to peg him. I thought I'd have him pegged, and then he'd turn around and do something that completely surprised me and revealed to me that, no, in fact, I did not have him pegged. The, the thing about processing this book, whether you're a teenager or an adult or somewhere in between, <laughs> Um, is that you have to be okay. You have to find out, you have to figure out how to be okay with not having someone pegged, with not having someone's identity fully in grasp, because no one has their own identity fully in grasp. No matter whether you're an adult or a teenager, you, you never really fully understand who you are, and so you have to be okay with never fully understanding who you're loving. You just have to love them for the fact that they are human, that they have interests, that they have passions. I think that's all the time we have. That's all the time we have. So uh, we'll be around at break if you want to talk to anyone. But uh, thanks again to my 14s and for Jean being here.